Uh, Professor Kozlov, and it's a great pleasure to be here in St. Petersburg to enjoy the White Nights. It's uh, my first time in uh, seeing this, and it's uh, been delightful so far. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, in some generalities about the uh, Cancer Genome Atlas Project and what its uh, legacy is and what is emerging from its legacy. And so I'll make some general comments about what we've accomplished so far and uh, uh, show some examples that kind of highlight where uh, we, and when I say we, I mean the collective uh, cancer community, uh, are going with it. Um, so <clears throat> the Cancer uh, Genome Atlas Project has been likened to the Big Bang for uh, precision medicine in cancer. This um, has uh, led to a large uh, variety of new uh, targeted therapies that uh, target different uh, genes frequently mutated in cancers. Uh, there must be a uh, hundred different uh, therapies in the pipeline now, uh, and as we've heard a little while ago, uh, not all of them are working yet. We'll explore some of the reasons for that in this talk. But um, it's interesting to uh, see the problem you were having with the, uh, with the advance. Let's, can we go back? Yes. Can we go forward? Yes, okay. So uh, just to reflect on this for a minute, um, the, what made the Cancer Genome Atlas possible was the generation of the human reference sequence, which uh, <clears throat> was developed in 2004. Prior to that, uh, there was a lot of controversy about whether we should have a uh, uh, human genome project at all. And uh, luminaries such as Renato Del Becco, uh, uh, through their support behind this project, he was a cancer researcher, and he realized that given uh, a reference genome, that we would be able to one day, uh, humans would become essentially an experimental animal, uh, preferable uh, to mice because we would have uh, cell lines for which we knew uh, a complete genomics characterization, and also um, <clears throat> that there may be therapies that could be developed that are more generalized therapies. We might find some keys to uh, malignancy that are completely uh, generalized and therefore simplify the therapeutic outlook. And so later today, uh, you'll hear from Professor Kozlov, who will describe some possibilities along these lines. So these were uh, incredibly uh, visionary thoughts uh, for 1986 when this was uh, proposed. So, uh, so we're now at the dawn of uh, understanding cancer well enough to uh, see the possibility of precision medicine. Um, <clears throat> so what has this project uh, accomplished? Well, there are roughly two and a half petabytes of data available now from uh, 11,000 patients. This is uh, 11,000 patients distributed over 33 cancers, 10 of which were very rare cancers. Uh, this is about enough data to see the generalized outlines of what a tumor cell is for these uh, different cancers. Uh, it's probably not enough data yet, but uh, it's at least a start. And the data types that we have are uh, first DNA sequencing that uncovers point mutations. We get structural information from SNP array data, uh, methylation data, epigenetics from a methylation platform, transcriptomes in the form of microRNA and messenger RNA, and a proteomics platform uh, reverse phase protein arrays. Uh, the data is available at the gdc.cancer.gov, and anybody uh, in the field 
can apply uh, for access to this data and use it for their own uh, bioinformatic experiments. So <clears throat> the generalized accomplishments are that we have improved our understanding of the molecular basis of cancer. In 2004, when the human genome was complete, we knew of 290 cancer genes. Today, we know of uh, more than 720 cancer genes. Um, <clears throat> we are now uh, equipped with molecular uh, uh, classification of most tumor types. These classifications are much more relevant prognostically and than the old uh, uh, pathology-based um, classification system. And we are on the verge, as I mentioned, of developing uh, precision medicine with targeted therapies. So in addition, we've revealed the details of the microenvironment, and you've heard a lot about that in the previous lecture. Uh, using both methylation and gene expression data. We've defined new diagnostic and prognostic mutations, revealed details of mutational processes through mutational signatures, and we've uncovered novel mechanisms of tumorigenesis that involve aberrant <coughs> splicing, chromatin modification, DNA damage response, and extreme mutator uh, phenotypes, which uh, we'll discuss in a minute. So uh, overall, one of the initial surprises was the vast uh, range over which the cancer genome is mutated. This figure shows uh, a series of cancers, and the vertical axis is the log 10 of the mutation frequency. First, you can see that all tumors have a very wide range of mutation frequencies. The average being roughly 1 to 10 uh, mutations per megabase. Uh, in rare cases, we have cancers that go up to uh, above 100 to almost 1,000 mutations per megabase, and these are generally cancers that, are, uh, that have a strong environmental uh, mutagen associated with them. The The uh, patients that have between 10 and 100 uh, mutations per megabase are generally uh, caused by a phenomenon known as microsatellite instability. Uh, this, let's see, <coughs> oops. Okay, well, um, uh, so those are uh, cancers with mutation frequencies in here. And um, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about both the, uh, uh, oh, sorry, there's one other uh, uh, very high frequency uh, cancer type that's caused by mutation in the replicative DNA polymerase when the uh, exonuclease domain, uh, which uh, is the proofreading domain of the polymerase, is itself mutated, then uh, the mutation frequency becomes very high in the absence of external uh, mutagens. And so these pole E exonuclease uh, uh, domain uh, cancers have become extremely interesting in the field of DNA replication. So I'll talk just a little bit about what uh, we've learned from polymerase epsilon and uh, origins of replication. This is a surprising sidelight to the cancer genomics in that this is a problem of intense interest in basic biology, but not uh, currently with uh, clinical applications. Um, <clears throat> as a review, we have uh, polymerase epsilon, which uh, in uh, all living cells uh, synthesizes the leading strand, polymerase delta 
synthesizes the lagging strand. And in uh, higher eukaryotes, these are known as pole E and pole D1. So um, we uh, and our colleagues showed that when the exonuclease domain is mutated, the, the primary change, uh, mutational change that occurs is a C to an A. Uh, and if you think about this for a second, um, on the top strand, uh, when the top strand is the leading strand, if a C to A mutation occurs, um, uh, when that's mapped back to the reference genome, you'll see a C to an A. But on the uh, bottom strand, the uh, leading strand is in the opposite direction. And now the C to the A on the bottom strand will become a G to a T when uh, these mutations are mapped to the reference genome. So uh, what happens then when we look at the mutation uh, the mutation uh, distribution from these cancers. Here I'm showing you 19 uh, rows that are the mutation C to A uh, that has occurred in these tumors with a pole E um, uh, exonuclease domain uh, damage. Down here are the location of all the G to T changes that have occurred. And you can clearly see uh, that the, C's to, the C to A's are clustered over here and the G to T's are clustered there. And this is one location in the genome. Here is another location elsewhere in the genome. And uh, we can clearly demark uh, an origin of replication in a human genome. This is a pretty amazing thing because uh, uh, up until now, origins of replication could be studied mainly only in bacterial or uh, mitochondrial genomes. We found about, um, <clears throat> about 3,000 uh, transitions like this around the genome, indicating uh, about one uh, origin of replication per megabase distributed around the genome. So. Uh, I'll just mention a couple things about microsatellite instability. Uh, we've heard a lot about the immune microenvironment. And here uh, I'm showing uh, the expression, the gene expression of several markers associated with immune response to a tumor. Um, and what you can see is that these markers are uh, generally expressed at higher levels in tumors with microsatellite instability. Uh, than they are in the tumors without microsatellite instability. And uh, this has led to the approval, uh, sorry, um, well, this has led to the approval of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, pembrolizumab in particular for patients uh, who have microsatellite instability regardless of tumor type. Here, um, showing uh, the level of microsatellite instability in uh, across uh, 30 different tumors um, when the microsatellite in index is above the line right here we consider it a microsatellite instable tumor and you can see that nearly every tumor has at least some microsatellite uh, 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 instable patients e each dot is a different patient so, uh, so a year ago, this uh, uh, pembrolizumab was approved for any tumor with microsatellite instability. And this is indeed the first example of a drug that depends not on the tumor type, but on the genetic composition of the tumor. So we're heading towards the vision of uh, Dilbeco in uh, uh, in this particular treatment. <clears throat> I don't know if the battery is getting weaker in this. You may, you may need to replace the battery. Hello? Um, okay. <clears throat> so, uh, so as a result of uh, the collection of mutations over the past decade of the TCGA, we have uh, many 
cancers that are in uh, that either have FDA approved drugs or they're in clinical trials or preclinical trials. But uh, the noteworthy part of this curve, uh, uh, this shows the number of drugs at each one of these stage, stages for all these tumors. Uh, the noteworthy thing is that uh, whether or not you're going to benefit from the new therapies depends on what cancer you have. If, if you're lucky enough to have a cancer on this side of the, of the distribution, you might be uh, a little better off. And indeed, there are some uh, common cancers here, colon, uh, melanoma, glioma, um, uh, rectal and endometrial cancer. But down here on the tail, there isn't much uh, happening. So, uh, so we heard earlier today that uh, one of the issues with the new uh, targeted therapies is that um, they only provide a short additional increase in lifespan. Uh, another one is uh, that it's highly dependent on what cancer you have, whether you even uh, are able to take advantage of uh, the new therapies. <clears throat> So we'll talk uh, for a minute about liver cancer and some of the changes that uh, may be on the horizon as a result of findings in uh, liver cancer. I want to make the point, though, that we have significant hurdles on the road to precision medicine in that not all cancers are rich in therapeutic targets. Not all cancer driver genes are detectable by uh, mutation status. NGS sequencing of DNA alone is insufficient to guide therapy for most patients. And most patients with a mutation in a gene targeted by a specific drug uh, develop resistance to the drug within a few months to uh, years. So uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, this uh, profile shows uh, the uh, gene mutation frequencies across uh, 196 patients. The patients are in columns. The, the mutated genes are in rows. And wherever you see a colored tile, that corresponds to a mutation in a gene. And uh, this cancer illustrates what I was just saying in that uh, although we can detect mutations very easily and abundantly in this cancer, the top four mutated genes, TERT, P53, beta-catenin, and CDKN2A, don't have, uh, are not therapeutic targets for any drug. So uh, uh, the mutation profiles here give us uh, nothing to go on for these patients. In addition, uh, as with all cancers we've looked at so far, there are some patients with a few or no uh, driver genes at all anyway. So we don't really know what the underlying genetic basis of tumors like that is. So we call that the genetic dark matter sometimes. In 2007, the drug serafinib was approved for liver cancer. Serafinib is a multi-kinase inhibitor that uh, inhibits the uh, VEGF and uh, uh, fibroblast uh, growth factor receptors, among others. And uh, it was on the basis of this data that the drug was approved. And uh, you can see here that the median uh, life expectancy moves by two and a half months, merely two and a half months at this point. So. Um, subsequent to that publication, to that clinical trial, many other uh, kinase inhibitors have been tried, and so far they uh, are not moving the needle. Um, uh, lines going this direction indicate Im uh, improvement in therapy. Lines going this direction indicate no improvement. Uh, one drug was borderline improved. Um, this is uh, as first line, and then as second line therapy, uh, 
three other drugs have shown some activity, but now these drugs uh, are only modestly increasing life expectancy by a few more months as well. So, uh, so the, uh, the, the pace of development of drugs is surprisingly slow. Okay, and uh, as it happens, in some countries like the US, uh, liver and bile duct cancers, uh, mortality from those cancers is increasing very rapidly, unlike for most cancers where uh, mortality is decreasing. So uh, this is a uh, very serious problem. So this, uh, so we're studying the transcription of uh, uh, oops, we're, we're studying here transcription of uh, a set of 20 genes that are regulated by p53. When p53 is mutated in this tumor, uh, these genes are uh, shut down, indicated by the blue. When uh, p53 is wild type, they're upregulated. Up, up on this track, oops, uh, up on the top track, you see the uh, mutation status of the patients. Uh, a green bar is p53 mutated, a yellow bar is uh, p53 wild type. So if you look at the uh, outcome of these patients, based on their p53 mutation status, you see no difference in patients that are wild type from patients that are mutated. But if you look just at the transcription signature and compare the high quartile to the low quartile, there's a significant difference in prognosis. So we can recognize uh, and use p53 as a prognostic indicator by following its gene, uh, its impact on gene regulation, but not on its mutational state. Um, whoops, let me go back. Uh, one other thing I want to point out here is that among these highly regulated genes by p53 is a gene called uh, patch D4, which is part of the hedgehog pathway. So hedgehog is a morphogen active during embryogenesis. Uh, it's also very important in organogenesis, and it regulates cell division of adult stem cells, and has been shown to play a critical role in tumorigenesis for diseases like medulloblastoma and basal cell carcinoma. So, in the patch regulation, we see uh, possible footprints of uh, activity of this pathway in hepatocellular carcinoma. So this is a reminder of what the, uh, of the outline of hedgehog signaling. Uh, patched is an inhibitory uh, membrane-bound protein. It inhibits uh, the gene smoothened, and when smoothened is inhibited, then you get no signaling from the, uh, from the pathway. But upon binding of hedgehog, the inhibition of smoothen is relieved, and now the pathway becomes active. So unlike many uh, receptor tyrosine kinases, the hedgehog ligand uh, uh, inhibits a gene rather than sending stimulatory signals. So it only indirectly uh, sends sig uh, uh, activating signals. And so what happens then is that when P53 is mutated, patched is downregulated. Without patched uh, activity, then smoothened can become constitutively active and the uh, hedgehog pathway is turned on. So that uh, change is summarized here. Now, uh, there's another gene that's uh, also in the membrane, part of this pathway called hedgehog interacting protein. And when, hedge, when hedgehog interacting protein is present, it can block hedgehog from interacting with patch to turn on the pathway. And so uh, the presence of hedgehog interacting protein is 
an additional inhibitory mechanism to keep this pathway off. And what we found was that uh, although this gene is never mutated, um, it is silenced by DNA methylation. This uh, axis shows the level of methylation of the promoter of hedgehog, and um, this shows the gene expression activity. The blue dots are uh, normals for comparison, and each circle is a different patient. So uh, you can see that this gene is being shut down by methylation, and also transcriptionally silenced by other mechanisms that aren't uh, methylation-based. So, uh, so now we have two indications that, uh, that the hedgehog pathway might be activated, first from p53 mutation, second from hypermutation of the hedgehog in, uh, interacting protein. And now a third line of evidence comes from integration of HBV virus. When HPV integrates into genes, and these four, M MLL4, TERT, and CCNE1, are frequent uh, integration uh, sites of HPV, you can see that the expression level of those genes goes uh, way up. Th this is uh, simply showing each patient in the cohort and the relative expression level um, of the gene in those patients. And the uh, what should be red dots but are now yellow dots are, are the expression level of the integrated, um, uh, uh, of the patient with the integration. So we have one interesting example of HBV integrated into uh, the gene Glee, which is the final transcription factor uh, that activates the pathway. And uh, lo and behold, in that patient, Glee expression was uh, four times higher than uh, any other patient in the cohort. And so uh, this shows another uh, possible way of activating the pathway that circumvents entirely the uh, extracellular signaling. So uh, three uh, different lines of evidence. Now, how can we prove this? Well, uh, by looking at uh, hedgehog-inducible genes. Most of the genes that are upregulated by hedgehog are also upregulated by other transcription factors, but there are two, Glee 1 itself and Patched 1, that are uh, regulated only by, uh, by hedgehog. And so we can look at the uh, level of uh, Glee and see what happens. Here are the patients that are uh, mutated in p53, and you can see a low level of patch D4 signaling. Here is uh, wild type where uh, patch D4 is high, and you can see that when patch D4 goes down, Glee signaling goes up, and when uh, patch D4 is high, Glee signaling goes down. So uh, here we're looking in the RNA of the tumors of the patients in the study and inferring that, um, uh, that the pathway is uh, truly active. Now the thing about this is that um, uh, there are inhibitors of the hedgehog pathway. Uh, some of them have been approved. Uh, one uh, approved for basal cell carcinoma. Uh, also uh, approved for medulloblastoma, and another uh, in trial for acute promyelocytic leukemia. So many clinical studies are going on with inhibitors of the hedgehog pathway, but none of them are in liver cancer right now. Um, this shows that, uh, that there are uh, other opportunities. So um, gene mutation alone, then, is insufficiently informative to successfully treat most patients with most cancers. And TCGA and other large cohorts of untreated patients described uh, the genetics of tumorigenesis, whereas drug resistance, which leads to poor survival, is a ca cancer phenotype controlled by different genes. This, this is probably one of the most uh, important lessons to draw from this. The TCGA, uh, T 
took tumors from untreated patients. So the state of the genome that we see in those tumors is the state that arose from tumorigenesis. The, the phenotype we've looked at is tumorigenesis. If you want to look at resistance and understand uh, resistance to drugs, you have to set up uh, a genetic analysis that will reveal the details of resistance. One can do that by uh, taking groups of patients that have become resistant to a drug and patients that were sensitive to a drug and comparing the genomes and transcriptomes, essentially a TCGA of drug resistance. Um, uh, the transcriptional signatures using carefully chosen genes are more informative than mutations in some and possibly all cancers. And further analysis of signaling pathways, such as hedgehog signaling and HCC, may reveal therapeutically exploitable vulnerabilities in tumor biology. Uh, with that, I think I will end uh, and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Thank you for your wonderful presentation, and uh, the floor is open for questions. I cannot interpret what is asked out of the microphone. Uh, Great, thanks for your wonderful presentation. Tell me, please, what is your attitude to mutational load as a biomarker to assess potential uh, effectiveness of immunotherapy? Um, mutation load is uh, related to microsatellite instability. The microsatellite in stable tumors, uh, as I was showing, have uh, between 10 and 100 mutations per megabase. That, that mutation load itself is um, easy to measure and detect. Um, the microsatellite instability, per se, uh, adds to the mutation load a large number of frame shift mutations. Um, it's interesting that if you look at the uh, immune response in the pole E mutants that have an even higher mutational load, their immune response is actually slightly less. Uh, so that suggests that the microsatellite uh, instability with its frame shift mutations might be more immunogenic than uh, the uh, point mutations that you see in pole E. Uh, but in either case, the higher mutation frequency, the more evidence you see of immune uh, activation within the tumors. More questions? Cologne, Germany. So I'm doing pediatric oncology, and um, I have a question. Maybe you have an opinion about this. Um, do you think that is um, really uh, yeah, a good strategy if we talk about signaling networks, like expression signaling networks, um, that we compare pediatric data to common adult signaling pathways? I think in terms of developmental bio biology, and because we sometimes uh, have the impression that um, yeah, with, with very young children and like I'm said, uh, re, uh, doing research in neuroblastoma, maybe um, the signaling networks might be tissue specific and slightly different than what we have as a database to look up. So. Yeah, the uh, comparison uh, is always good. Um, of course, the, uh, the diseases that the um, uh, that the kids get are generally different than the diseases that adults get. In, in children, for example, uh, the liver cancer is hepatoblastoma rather than hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, although sometimes they do get hepatocellular carcinoma. 
Um, uh, I, I think comparing uh, is always useful to see what the differences in the uh, cell types might be. Um, uh, probably some of those differences arise from uh, a different progenitor cell for the tumor, and uh, so I, I think that is a, likely to be a fruitful avenue. Thank you. Okay. Professor Bonagora. Uh, David, is there any, uh, any um, evidence of uh, some uh, um, genetic disease in poly E, so the, the, the high mutation is related to some genetic disease, or do we have some pathogenetic mechanisms that will increase in some people uh, yes. the higher frequency? Yes. Um, so the high frequency of mutation is due to the uh, destruction of the exonuclease proofreading capability of the polymerase. Yeah, is there any disease? Now, there, any? Yes, yeah. Uh, so uh, in a very large study of uh, familial colorectal cancer, uh, Ian Tomlinson in the UK and his colleagues came across a few patients with uh, inherited pol e and also pol d one mutations. They tend to get uh, colon cancer, kind of like Lynch syndrome patients, but um, uh, they get them much younger. They're uh, usually found in uh, pediatric patients, believe it or not. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Willer. I would like to add, I agree with the name that TCGA is a huge resource, and I agree that transcriptional, uh, the analysis of transcriptomes will bring us even more information than the analysis of mutations, and in some of our uh, presentations, uh, we'll hear the same from uh, some other presentations.